following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Last time, uh, we gave a lecture about how to prepare the mind. But um, we have to remember in this, in this Gnostic tradition that we seek to walk the path of balance, which means utilizing and developing all three of the centers of the human organism. The mind, the heart, and the motor instinctive sexual brain. So I thought for this week, since we've already discussed the mind, that we would spend some time discussing the development of the heart. Now, we're not going to go too, too deep into this, because really the whole path is about the development of the heart. But since this is our, our, our our series on the preparation for esoteric studies. For those of us who are just beginning, we're going to look into some of the elementary aspects of, of how the heart can be developed and what are some of the, the qualities and characteristics we need to, to foster in ourselves in order to get ourselves ready for this type of work. Now, first of all, we want to ask, why is the heart important? And from a very uh, basic standpoint, we want to emphasize one of the things that Samuel Vior talks about with regards to psychological equilibrium. Because when he talks about the different types of personalities or, 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 or levels of being in a so, uh, related with the spiritual work, before one enters the kingdom of God and after one departs from the Tower of Babel, this state of being confused or, um, or disequilibrated, there is an intermediate state called the equilibrated human being. And why is this state necessary? He says here in his lecture uh, about negative emotions, if we want to be born again, to create a second body in order to penetrate into, into the Sephirotic region of Hod, the kingdom of heaven, then it is obvious that we should not torpidly waste our energies by letting ourselves be pulled in by negative emotions, such as violence, hatred, jealousy, pride, etc. If the energies are wasted by inferior emotions, then with what energy are we going to create a psychological body? How is this going to be achieved if we are wasting the energies? In order to create a psychological body, to be born again, it is necessary to save our energies. And so, this path, especially birth, especially the process of birth, is related to the, the harnessing and, and the, the utilization of energies in order to uh, create something new within us. And in order to 
create something new, we actually need to have energies to create it with. And so if we're wasting energies through the mind or through the heart or through the sex, then we're not going to be able to advance anywhere in this work. The symbol with regards to, to this teaching, with regards to the second birth given in the Old Testament is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, many people, they understand the Ark of the Covenant to contain the two tablets of the law with, with the Ten Commandments given to Moses on the mount. But they forget that inside the Ark of the Covenant is also the rod of Aaron and the cup of manna from the desert. And so most people in society miss or fail to understand a huge portion of what that covenant was that was represented by the ark. We Gnostics understand that this, this rod and this cup represent the sexuality. But there is a tendency among Gnostics to sometimes forget what most of society remembers that the Ark of the Covenant also contains the two tablets of the law. <laughs> that in order to successfully utilize this covenant, we also need the ethical foundations and the guidance of the commandments. And so we need to make sure that we're being cognizant of those commandments on all the levels of our being because they operate on many levels. Therefore, saving the energy that is needed to complete the arc. Some Ellen Vior says, when one opens the doors to negative impressions, one not only alters the order of the emotional center, which is in the heart, but moreover, one makes this center negative. For example, if somebody we know is filled with anger because another person hurt him, we open the doors to those impressions and end up taking the side of our friend and feeling animosity towards the one who hurt him. We too become filled with anger without even having played a part in the matter. Thus, this is the way that human beings infect each other with their negative atmospheres. Thieves alter other people into becoming thieves. Murderers infect someone else. Drug addicts infect other people. This is how drug addicts, thieves, usurers, murderers, etc., etc., multiply. Why? Because we commit the error of always opening our doors to negative emotions. And this is never right. Therefore, let us select our emotions. If someone brings us positive emotions of light, beauty, harmony, happiness, love, and perfection, then let us open the doors of our heart to him. But if someone brings us negative emotions of hate, violence, jealousy, drugs, alcohol, fornication, and adultery, why should we open the doors of our heart to him? Let us close them. Close the doors to all negative emotions. Samuel says elsewhere that negative emotions are more infectious than any disease. You can pick them up just by being in, in the, the room with certain people. I'm not sure if you've ever noticed this, but sometimes you can walk into a room and you can feel the negative emotions in that room, either fear or, or trepidation or, or anger. You can sometimes even feel it on the subway if, you, if, you're, if you're traveling around New York. Like, without even necessarily interacting with people, you can pick that sort of thing up from the environment. These things are incredibly infectious. I remember a friend of mine who, um, who was in graduate school for, uh, for a, a particular type of uh, humanities. And um, there was a lot of concern among the people in, in his, his graduate program. Uh, about getting a job after af after graduation because they they, they knew that the uh, the job market in this particular type of field was 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 very competitive very harsh <coughs> and um, 
in talking to him, he was, every conversation with him seemed to revolve around this, this fear and, and concern about his well-being and his future. Because he was interacting with all these other people from his program, and all these other people had this fear of, of being unemployed. And this fear was infecting him. And so I, 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 I talked to him for a bit, and um, eventually he came to realize that he needed to, to, to step outside of this environment for a little while. And so he was, he was a Methodist, so um, he got involved with his church. And, and I'm not sure if you know about the Methodists, but Methodists are, are very much... Uh, uh, they place a great value on the, the corporal works of mercy, um, um, helping the homeless, uh, feeding the poor, uh, comforting the afflicted. And so he got involved with this Methodist church, and um, he, he, he spent a great deal of his time working at homeless shelters and, and, and soup kitchens, and, and he stopped interacting with all these people from, from his graduate program, and it, it completely changed his, his whole psychological character. Just by changing his environment, by doing something to, to help others and being around others who were, who were positive, he changed his whole outlook on life. And not only that, he, 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 he now has um, a, um, a great job working, working at a university, and he's, he's very happy. <clears throat> so I'm not uh, something important to recognize about this is not just that our situation can affect our emotions, but also that our emotions can affect our situations. This is actually, um, it's this, this idea is becoming very popular in the, uh, in the, the New Age kind of movement. In the, um, there's this, this, series of, of, of uh, this movement out there. They call it The Secret. You might, you might have heard of this. It's, it's about the, the law of attraction. And it's, um, it's, it's basically, it's, it's something that we've all heard before in, in this tradition because we're familiar with the concept that the external is a reflection of the internal. And that's all this secret is. And they have these, these, these movies and, and these books and these, these seminars that you can go to where they, they basically just teach you how to um, change your psychological uh, state in order to manifest um, positive outcomes in the external world. And this is, this is 100% real. Um, it's been taught in, in many different traditions. Padmasambhava taught about this in, uh, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Samuel and York said, uh, uh, repeated this many times in, in, in his books. And so this is, this, it's, it's, not, it's not hocus pocus, this is real. However, the problem with the, the way that this, this method is being taught by this particular movement that is, that is advocating it is that they're using it to, um, to try to harness and manifest their desires, like physical desires for... Um, uh, like a, a career, or um, uh, or a house, or a car, or 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 or, or a particular uh, spouse, or whatnot, and the whole way that they're framing this is is training people to feed energy into desires, which only makes those desires stronger. But the principle this uh, that that's behind this this is just a, a law of nature that the 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 external world that we, that, we, that we observe is a reflection of our internal environment, can be used also to, um, to create situations that are conducive to our spiritual work. And so you're welcome to, 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 to utilize this law in any way that you want, but obviously we, we, have, um, we have certain recommendations that we would make in this school. Um, but we don't want we don't want to be uh, casting judgment on on the decisions of, of of any person. First of all, 
Furthermore, with regards to negative emotions. Samuel says, what is most terrible is that negative emotions transform the human being into a liar. The liar produces a mistaken connection because the energy of the elder of days, our father who is in heaven, the truth, flows harmoniously and perfectly through the ten sephiroth of the Hebraic Kabbalah until reaching Malkuth, or the kingdom, the physical person, or the psychophysical person. The liar connects himself in a wrong way. He intentionally, with his negative emotions, produces a dislocation of his mind, and consequently, a lie emerges, which is a mistaken connection. One can be a liar due to a negative emotion that transforms us into slanderers and liars, or one can be con consciously and by will a liar. In any case, these are negative connect connections of the mind with the superior centers of the being. A dislocation of the mind with the superior centers of the being is produced. Therefore, we do not perceive things in their true sense. So if you're not familiar with, with the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah that he's talking about here is just, uh, just refers to the, the, the different aspects of our, own, uh, of our own internal being, of our spirit. And we have a connection with our own inner God. But that connection is, is tainted, uh, is, is bent when we pollute ourselves with negative emotions. And so the inner truth that we have within becomes distorted when we, when we are, are, are manifesting negative emotions within us. And so what he's referring to here is the Eighth Commandment. And if you understand the commandments with respect, to the, with respect to the different parts of our being, the Sephiroth and the Tree of Life of the Kabbalah. The eighth Sephiroth is Hod, which is the astral body, which is related to the heart. And the eighth commandment is thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, which is, the, which is related to, to truth to not telling lies. And so what this is saying here is that when we manifest negative emotions in our heart, then we become a liar. We violate this eighth commandment. Because we say into ourselves, oh, that person cut me off, or oh, oh that person is trying to sabotage me, when really... it's quite possible that nothing of the sort is happening to us. But negative emotions cause us to, to concoct all these, these ridiculous fantasies in our head and to, feel, uh, and, to, and to feel anger and animosity towards people and to, to bear false witness against them in our heart, to wrongly condemn others in our heart, which turns us into a liar and violators of this Eighth Commandment. But there are other commandments, too, that we, we violate in our heart. Jesus in the gospel said that if you grow angry with your brother, then you kill him in your heart. Fifth commandment. If you look at a woman with lust, then you've committed adultery with her in your heart. The sixth commandment. And so, the Eighth Commandment has, has a very particular relationship with the heart, but there are ways to, to violate all of the commandments, commandments with respect to our own heart. And so, like I said earlier, we have to be cognizant of each of these commandments and all of the centers of our being. Now, we talked about negative emotions, but how can we deal with negative emotions when they come up? Samuel and Vior has uh, a very useful uh, exercise that I want to share with you with respect to the um, 
with respect to the handling of the emotional center because, as he says here, it's very difficult. And this is a long thing, but uh, we're going to read the whole thing because I had to translate this whole thing from Spanish. <laughs> so uh, we're going to read every word of it. <laughs> so he says, Only with the fire can we disintegrate the defects in the five cylinders of the organic machine. This is obvious. My dear brothers and sisters, among the centers that we have in our organism, there is no doubt that the most difficult to control is the emotional center. Because the intellectual, although it causes trouble with certain subjects, more or less, we can control it. The motor that produces our movements and which is located in the superior part of our dorsal spine, is also controllable. One can control the movements of his body. Walk if you want to walk. Raise your arm if you want to raise your arm. Or don't raise it. Wrinkle your brow. Or don't wrinkle it. So all the activities of the motor center are, are under our will. But the emotional center is terrible. The issue of negative emotions, sentiment, and sentimentality become difficult to control. In Hindustan, for example, they compare the emotional center with an elephant, an insane elephant. For example, what do they do in Hindustan to control it? They place it side by side between two healthy, sane elephants. They moor them to each other so that they walk off together. And then the two sane elephants fully manage to teach the crazy elephant to be sane. And finally, the insane elephant is cured. This system that they use in Hindustan is good. The emotional center is one elephant. The intellectual is another elephant. And the motor is the other elephant. The motor instinctive sexual center. These two elephants the intellectual and the motor, can control the elephant of the emotions. He continues. If at any time we are bursting with despair, with anguish, that is to say, we are identified with a negative emotion and are feeling bad, what can we do? We can lie down in bed, relax the body, and silence the mind. To relax ourselves, we are acting with the motor center, since we are relaxing. Re we relax our whole body. We loosen all of our muscles, all of the tension of our organism, and finally, put the mind in silence. That is to say, bring the mind to quietude and silence. What happens? The emotional center has no other option than to calm down a little, to become a little more serene, and finally, the intellectual and motor centers come to dominate the crazy elephant. You can also control inferior emotions by means of superior emotions, as all of you know very well. A family member dies. We scream. We cry. We despair. Why? We do not want to accept the inevitable. And this is terrible. One in life must learn to accept the inevitable. We lose a loved one, and we cry full of anguish, and don't accept it. And we see the body there in a coffin, but do not think that he is dead. We believe it is possible for us that he died. That we, believe, we do not believe that it is possible for us that he died, and we are delivered into desolation and despair. This is terrible. How can we overcome this state? Two ways. The first is that we appeal to the two elephants, the motor center and the intellectual center, relaxing the body and putting the mind in silence. That would be one method. Another is that we can appeal to superior emotions. Perhaps it would do us a lot of good in these moments to listen to a symphony by Beethoven or the magic flute by Mozart submerging ourselves full of emotion in profound meditation, reflecting on the mysteries of life and death. Then, 
By means of superior emotion, we control the inferior emotions and annul the pain that the death of our loved one has given us. That is obvious. The emotional center is very interesting, but we have to manage our inferior emotions to control them, to make them submit, and this is possible in accordance with our teachings. Inferior emotions cause a lot of harm. Inferior emotions, like bullfighting, the cinema, like the orgies of rowdy celebrations, like when they draw the lottery, or that which is stirred up by a newspaper story about a war, or the many things that happen in the world. Inferior emotions like what we get from tequila. Inferior emotions like those that develop in people through all their animal behavior serve no purpose except to fortify the inhuman psychic aggregates that we carry within and to create new ones as well. It is necessary to eliminate inferior emotions by means of superior emotions. This is possible. Learn to live a life that is edifying and essentially dignified. This is essential. Otherwise, no progress would be possible. How? In what manner? We also need to be more sincere with ourselves in order to develop the superior emotional center. Free ourselves. Free ourselves from that which is only negative and superficial. And so I thought this was useful because <coughs> he not only gives a technique for several techniques for how we can handle uh, the, the disobedience of the emotional center, but he also bring, brings our attention to what some of the ways that that emotional center is, is harming us. Going to the movies often uh, arouses in us inferior emotions because we're caught up in the, in the identification with, with the film. And most films that they create, they create nowadays are certainly not healthy to our psychological state. He says bullfighting, but we can also get inferior emotions from like football, <laughs> when we're, we're, we're sitting there rooting, uh, rooting for our team and getting identified with the, uh, uh, with, with the, with, with the players, or, or, even, or even mourning for a loved one. And that, 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 can, be, that can be hard for us to say that this, that this pain we feel at the death of a loved one is, is harming us. But really, it's not, it's not doing us any good. It's not doing any good for us or for the, the person we're mourning. Because we want to allow that soul to be, to be free from this world, to be free from this life. We don't want to try to pull that person back into this, the personality that they've left behind. If we love that person, we want them to be able to continue to develop and continue with their evolution. So how can we cultivate positive emotions? Well, some of them give some suggestions here. Classical music, meditation. Music is, is, a, is a tricky one because Music has a very profound impact on our emotional state. And it can be addictive. And so we're not going to tell you, go listen to, to, to this, 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 don't listen to this, this, this. But what I will say to you is be cognizant of the emotional state that certain music, uh, certain music fosters within you. Music nowadays is, is meant to... Um, is largely meant to, to, to hypnotize us and to cause a welling up in us of desire or, or, or anger. And so be cognizant of, of, of what's happening when you listen to music. Pay attention to yourself. This is a, a, a part of self-observation. And... See what happens when you, when you listen to, a, to a, a new piece of music. 
And this isn't just uh, a recommendation with regards to pop music. This is regards to classical music, too. So many types of, of, of music that fall in the classical genre uh, uh, don't foster in us the same types of positive emotions as, as, uh, as, as Bach or Beethoven. And so we don't, we're not going to give a list of, like, this is approved, this isn't approved, this isn't approved. But we're just going to say, be cognizant of your emotions even when you listen to classical music and see what it does to you. And if you find something that works for you, enjoy it. Other things that I would suggest. Taking a walk. Staring at the stars. I have a story that I want to share with regards to that. I was... Um, I was meditating one night on a, on a particular ego. And um, those of you who've, who've meditated on your egos before will, will be familiar with the, the experience that sometimes when you, you meditate on an ego and you recollect the experience, that um, it's kind of like uh, trying, to, trying to handle a, a, a small animal with big teeth. If you hold it the right way, like a, a snake handle or something, if you hold it the right way, you, c you can control it. But if you don't hold it the right way, the thing can, uh, can, can reach its neck around and bite you. And you get identified with that situation, with that ego, and you, you, uh, you, you get sucked back into the scenario, and then you, then, then you feel all, all, all torn up inside. Because you, 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 you didn't keep the proper distance in the meditation. So that's what happened to me in this particular instance where I was working on this ego and I got identified. And I was, I was, I was, I was trying really hard to fight it. And I, 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 I was trying to silence my mind. And I, I couldn't get out of it. I couldn't shake it. So I was sitting there in my meditation like, I can't do this anymore. So I, 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 without even thinking, I just got up and I walked. And I walked outside and it was around midnight. And I, I kept walking, walking, walking. And I walked to the center of campus. And I, I walked up, up to the library and... Uh, and I climbed up the stairs, and I went out onto a ledge where they had a big, uh, uh, a big lantern. Uh, and I sat in the shadow of the lamppost, and I just stared at the stars. And I stayed there for a good 45 minutes. And staring at the stars put everything in perspective for me. And I was able to free myself from the identification with that ego. And that night had a profound impact on my life. So don't underestimate the power of, of, of awe. Other things to cultivate positive emotions. You can read. But things that not don't read, like don't go read science magazine. Um, <laughs> that, 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 that's not really good for your emotional center. Um, what I'm talking about is, is, is poetry, scriptures, fairy tales. Try laughing. Sitting next to a tree. <laughs> Doing something kind for, for someone else. Spending time with those you love. Praying, breathing fresh air, but breathe through your nose. I've noticed that um, if when I breathe through my nose, I'm a much happier person than when I breathe through my mouth. It, it, uh, we've talked about this in this school a lot, the, uh, the importance of, of, of breathing through your nose, and it's, uh, it's, it's not to be underestimated. Listening to the sound of birds or the chirping of crickets, going out at night, at dusk, to watch the fireflies as they come out, or the bats as they fly in the sky, and just being present with the poetry of life. That can help you cultivate superior emotion, which leads us to our next point about being present. 
In his book, Fundamental Education, in a chapter called Generosity, Samuel M. Vior says, if spouses had generosity, they would forget their painful past and would live in plentitude, filled with true happiness. The mind kills love, destroys it. Furthermore, experiences, old discussions, past jealousy, all of this accumulation of the memory destroys love. So this process of thinking that we get involved with can interfere with the genuine experience of emotion. That's why I didn't tell you to read Science Magazine to cultivate superior emotions, because mental development always comes at the cost of the heart. Now, you remember our lecture from last time, what we don't, we're, we're not telling you to cast aside the intellect entirely. The intellect is important, but we need to learn how to be balanced. Now, I want to point something out here. Why is this chapter called generosity? Generosity refers to the act of letting go, to give something for the benefit of another being. And it doesn't have to be something material. You can give up your resentments, your envy, your attachment to the past discretions of another person. That is an act of giving. It's an act of sacrifice. And it's a type of generosity. Furthermore, true generosity means being present to those that you are serving. Actually being present for the one you love. Being there with them giving them your attention, giving them your heart. <clears throat> I'm not sure if you've, ever, um, if you've ever read the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, but they, um, they've become more popular because they've made some, some, some movies about them recently, but they were, they, were, they were books before they were movies. And um, in the books, there's uh, uh, one, of the, one of the chronicles is a story called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And in this story, the children in the story, they, they enter this magical land of fantasy and, and fairy tales by going through the back of a wardrobe in, in the house of an old magician. And they spend decades in this magical land of Narnia. And then, after learning many things in this magical place, they, rather mistakenly, stumble back into our mundane world, coming out of the wardrobe. And they're, when they get back to the world, they say, oh my gosh, we've left Narnia, we want to go back. And they try going back to Narnia by going back into the wardrobe. But when they, go to, they, re, when they return to the wardrobe, they would find that the, the path is blocked. It's just an ordinary wardrobe. And so they go to the master of the house, and they tell him about their adventures in Narnia. And he, being a magician, knows all about the place, because he's been there too. And he tells them, with regards to this wardrobe, you cannot return to Narnia through the wardrobe, though you may go back again, because magic never happens the same way twice. And so there's a lesson to be learned from the, from the words of this magician. That when we're looking for, for, for magic in our life, in order to truly experience it, we need to be fully present for the poetry of life. We need to be fully present for the experiences that we are seeing. He doesn't mean that we have to be doing something new every time. But it means that we can't be continually grasping at the past. We can't be going back to the same places and the same people looking to repeat 
the experiences that we hold in our memory. Because those experiences are gone and they can never happen again. And if we're continually looking towards the past, we'll always miss the magic of the moment. Just to emphasize this, there's a place that I like to go to in Central Park called the Conservatory Garden. And um, in this garden, there is a fountain. And I've gone back to that fountain many times, and I've spent many hours sitting next to this fountain or on the benches in this garden. And it's magical for me every time because I'm present there every time. There's something different and new about the experience to be perceived, no matter how many times you've perceived it. <coughs> As another example, when I was in college, the, um, there was a, a Zen teacher there who, who gave meditation lessons every Monday night for, for uh, an hour. And... Um, I went to this meditation lesson every week for years. And if it was just me, sometimes he would just set me to do a particular practice or, um, or, or teach me a, a, a new type of meditation. But if it was someone new, which happened about 75% of the time, usually it was, was me and a new person who had just walked in off the street and was looking to learn how to meditate. And if ever a new person came in, for the benefit of this new person, he would give his standard introduction to meditation lecture. And so every week, for years, I went there and I listened to this same introduction to meditation lecture. And every time I listened to it, I listened to it like I was hearing it for the first time. And every week I went there, I learned something new. It was the same lecture every time. But by continually looking at my practice and treating it like I was a beginner, I gained a lot in, in the foundation for my, for my meditation. And so we always want to be present for the experiences that, that, that we are living and not try to live in the past or in an anticipation of the future. And if we do, we can feel the magic of the moment. Now, with regard to how the mind can destroy love, we need to learn how to keep our mind in check in order to cultivate positive emotions. In the Aquarian message, Samael says, and here he's quoting from the book of Revelation, and unto the atomic angel of the church in Thyatira, write, these things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith and thy patience in thy works. And the last to be more than the first, charity, service, faith, and patience are the virtues required in order to open the church of Thyatira in the heart. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Then Samuel says, Jezebel is that harlot dressed in purple and scarlet. She is the intellectual mind that teaches us to fornicate and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Jezebel is politics, journalism, diplomacy, materialistic science, intellectualism of any type etc. Whosoever wants to open the church of Thyatira must have the mind of a child. Those who commit adultery with Jezebel, who called herself a prophetess, cannot know the wisdom of the tranquil heart. Love and wisdom are the secret path of the heart. The wisdom of the seal of the heart 
is for children. In other words, for those who do not commit adultery with Jezebel, who called herself a prophetess. If you want to open the church of Thyatira, you must attain the lost infancy. Jezebel is Satan. Jezebel is the I, the myself, the ego that we carry within. And Jezebel called herself a prophetess because our ego thinks that it is a prophet. It's always making predictions. He is going to say this to me, and then I'm going to react this way, and then he's going to do this, and I'm going to punch him in the face. <laughs> so we get caught up on all these fantasies, which, we, which carry us into negative emotions. But Jezebel is a soothsayer, not a prophet. Most of these fantasies never come true. Like Mark Twain, he said, I'm an old man. I've had many problems, most of which never happened. <laughs> the ego is a liar. And we lose all that emotional energy for no reason. Because most of these fantasies, these, these corrupt prof prophecies that, that, that the ego tries to give us just never come to pass. Then we get, we get into, into arguments, fighting with phantoms in our head. And yet, despite continually seeing that Jezebel's predictions are always wrong, for some reason, we still believe. The ego creates all sorts of complications in our mind. Somebody else talks about politics. Look, look at what hap what's happening in, in politics nowadays. Everyone's getting wrapped up in all this, this, this partisan thinking. We, 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 it, and, and even us who are not necessarily it, in, in office, we, we criticize elected officials. I talk to a lot of elected officials. Their job is very hard, and many of them feel sweeped up by the, by, by the pressure to pass certain, uh, 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 certain laws, too. They're, they're, they're being pressured by, 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 by lobbyists and by, by leaders in their own party to, 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 to act a certain way and, and to, 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 to vote for certain laws. And it's, it's very difficult for them to manage this, this, um, this, all, these, all these energies that are being directed in them from, from the whole nation in order to, uh, uh, in, in order to, in order to govern. But we, we, we criticize these, these people without, without fully being aware of, of the burden that they carry. And all in politics, we, 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 we see in the, in, the, in, in the advertising, especially around the election time, slandering, hating, trying to, trying to get others to experience negative emotions about a particular, um, a, a, a particular uh, official or candidate. And politics also causes us to pin our hopes on external forms. Some of them have said repeatedly that we, if we want to achieve a true revolution in our society, society is just the, the, the agglomeration of all the individuals. If we, want, if we truly want to change our society, we need to change ourselves. But there's this illusion with politics that if we only pass this certain law, or elected this certain person, that everything would, would, would become a paradise. And that's simply not the case, because that's just rearranging the terms on one side of an equation. The value of the equation stays the same. Society will still be, will, will, will still be infected with the ego. And we'll still have all the problems that, that, we, that we experience in, in, in our world. He talks about journalism, too. We talked about this in our, um, our first lecture in this series on um, the preparation for esoteric studies, where, where, where journalism is a prostitution of the intellect. We get involved with diplomacy, with, with, with nationalism, with flags, with territories, with who owns what, with, with which... Race or religion is control is in control of a certain of a certain country or 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 or, or territory. Science gets our mind locked up into a certain way of thinking. 
into a super intellectual way of, of perceiving the world that misses so many of the deeper aspects of our reality. And so we bottle up our minds and all these conceptual frameworks and ideas and our mind becomes so complicated that we can no longer appreciate the simple beauties of life. Samuel tells us that in order to truly develop the heart, to open the chakra of the emotional center, our mind must become like a child. And Jesus said the same thing. <clears throat> he said, I give praises to you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. For you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them unto the child." The doctrine that we teach here is not a doctrine for the intellect. It's not a belief system or a set of laws that are meant to be rotely followed. The doctrine that we teach here is a doctrine of the heart that's meant to be lived and understood in the heart. Jesus always got into, um, into arguments with Pharisees. Um, one time that's coming to my memory now is where he was picking grain on the Sabbath. And the, uh, and the Pharisees got, um, got upset with him because that was against the, the Jewish law. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, remember that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. We need to understand this doctrine in the heart. Another story that, um, that, that comes to mind. Um, I was in college, and I, uh, I walked out of my dorm one day into the hallway, and I, um, I saw this Jew sitting on the stairs. And he was looking very sad. I said to him, why are you sad? And he said, well, I really have to go to the bathroom. Well, uh, I said, the bathroom is right here. Here's the door. It's not locked or anything. You can walk right in. He said, yes, but today is the Sabbath day. I said, yeah. He said, well, in that bathroom, there is a motion sensor that turns on a light. And if I open the door to that bathroom, the motion sensor will see me. And I will have turned on the light. And it is against the Jewish law to, to make or break an electrical circuit on the Sabbath day. Now, I've read the, I've read the, um, uh, the Old Testament, too, and uh, I must have missed the portion about uh, electrical circuits in the, that, that Moses was talking about. But, but this guy was a Jew, so I trust this guy, and I, I, I'm assuming it must have been buried in the Hebrew somewhere, and I'm, my Hebrew is not very good. So I, I, I said to him, how about if I open the door for you and then... I would, break, I would break the Sabbath on your behalf, and then you could use the bathroom. <laughs> and he said, well, that would work. That would be fine. So I went and I opened the door, and the light turned on, and he ran into the bathroom. <laughs> and so <laughs> the, um, we, we, we don't want to criticize his, his understanding of, of, of religion because he, he, was, he was being very sincere in his, in, in, in his honoring of, of, of God in, in the way that he, he thought was important. But nevertheless, in this particular tradition, we, we reject that sort of um, that, that, that literalistic uh, understanding of, of, of the law. The, um, and we, 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 we seek to understand how, how, the, how the precepts, how, how the commandments uh, apply in spirit more than, than in letter. Now, um, with regards to... Uh, uh, we don't, we, uh, don't want to criticize other people's, uh, other people's religion. Now, we have a particular understanding in this school, but that, that doesn't mean that we, we want to impose this understanding on, on others. That's why I was happy to break the Sabbath for this, for, for this individual because um, it, I don't feel bound by that particular law. But as some of the says, we must be charitable. We sin against Christian charity when we criticize the religion of others. 
cultivate respect and veneration. Respect your neighbor's belief. Res respect the religion of your neighbor. And do not force anyone to think your way. Do not criticize. Remember that each head is a world. Do not sin any more against the charity of Christ. Humanity is divided and subdivided into groups, and each group requires a special system of teaching. Each group needs its school, its religion, its sect. These are the commandments of the Blessed One. We violate the law of the tranquil heart when we criticize others. And so, when we first come into this, this teaching, we, we become excited by all these concepts, and a lot of times we, we, we try to convince others of our point of view. But we must always remember that uh, what Samuel and Vior said repeatedly, that everyone must be free to think what they like. There is beauty in every authentic religion. And in general, judging other people is, is, is bad for our heart. Sitting around passing judgments on others gets really tedious. And I'm not sure if you've noticed this, but when you judge others, you also start to become paranoid about being judged yourself. When we, look, when we take a certain view of the world, we tend to project that mental framework onto other people and assume, and assume that, that other people have the same kind of view. And so when we judge others, when we're always criticizing, oh, the, that, that person's pants, oh, that, that, that person's accent, then we start, we, we, we start to believe that other people are, 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 are judging us as well. And maybe they are. Who knows? But what hurts is not the judgment that other people carry in their head, because most of the times you don't even know what the judgment is in their head. What hurts us the most is the judgment that w the, the, the judgment that we project into other people's heads. We're not afraid of the opinions of others. We're afraid of our perceptions of the opinions of others. We rarely know what other people are, are thinking of us. But we do have to deal with the phantoms of others that we carry in our head. And those phantoms can hurt a lot. So don't judge. And don't listen to the phantoms either. Now, a little more on the damage that our mind can cause. It's said in the Zohar, the, uh, the section on, on Yitro, paragraph 44. Job was a master of awe. And this awe was the essence of his worship. And it is valued because a person is not able to draw down a spirit from above, whether in the realm of the holy or the other side, and can't get close to it unless the worship is in awe. The heart and will have to be directed in awe. And then, with a broken heart, the higher spirit can be drawn down and the desired effect achieved. Now this is a beautiful paragraph from the Zohar that we've talked about many times in this school, um, particularly in our lectures on, on Moses. Um, but today I just wanted to, I wanted to bring it up again um, to emphasize that awe is a quality of the heart. And it is a quality that emerges when we gaze upon that which cannot be contained by the mind. When we conceptualize something, when we try to, to box it up, we necessarily make it smaller. We make it into something that we can control, we can, we can manage. But this awe, this quality of prayer, this quality of the heart that is absolutely essential,
in establishing a connection with God. can be cultivated when we look at things that the mind cannot conceive. The depth of the abyss, the majesty of God that caused the mind to evaporate like the dew in the, uh, in the afternoon sun. That's all. I'm talking a little bit on prayer. Samael says, internal meditation and internal prayer develop and unfold the chakra of a tranquil heart. When Jesus was asked, Master, what is the greatest commandment? He responded by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And so this first, most important commandment is about cultivating a relationship with your inner God, with learning how to love your God with all the parts of your being. And we foster this by meditation and prayer. <clears throat> prayer helps us to develop a cognizance of his presence. Not a belief, but the faith, the experience of his love. And prayer is an art, an art that's difficult to teach. And it takes practice and patience and perseverance. But if you reach out to God, he will reach back to you. This is also related with learning how to, how to sense with the heart. How to feel beauty in the scriptures and apprehend the depths that the mind cannot grasp. Now, with regards to this, I want to read a portion of a chapter from Samael's book, Cosmic Teachings of a Lama, which is a beautiful book. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. And this chapter is called The Consciousness, and it captures a lot of what I've been talking about today. And we're going to go through the whole thing before we talk about it. He said, when those memories reach me, those ardent effluvia from April and dawn, indeed, when feeling those refreshing drops of dew falling from heaven, I truly suffer for all of the millions of human beings who dream and weep. My consciousness awakened, I attained illumination. Where was I going, asleep along the rude cliff, rent in twain? I attentively beheld the firmament, and it was very high. Its tremendous summit with its vertigo enraptured me. Then I turned my face away from the deep, soaring height, and thus I saw the earth, and it was very low. The phoenix bird, when passing by in swift flight, touched me with its wings of immaculate whiteness. Then, filled with fervor, I prayed, knowing that the perfume of prayer always arrives to God. My prayer was for the sake of the sleepy ones, for those sincere, mistaken ones who dream that they are awakened, for those failed ones who assume 
that they are doing very well. The sage dreams of the splendid rose of the magical meadow that when blooming unfolds its delectable petals to the vespertine star of love. The long-haired bard dreams of the timid singing rivulet which when sliding down across the mountain seems to melt into silver, transfiguring everything into a filigree that runs and passes. The unfortunate mother dreams of the son whom she lost in the war. She cannot conceive of a harder fate beyond. Thus, she weeps of her broken joy at the foot of his portrait while the lightning plays with her torture and even lights an iris in every tear. The one in love dreams of the star rising resplendently in the east, of that long-awaited rendezvous, of the book that she holds in her hands, and of the romantic window. The offended husband dreams of an obscure dispute and rebellious quarrel, he suffers the unspeakable and even dies in his nightmare. <clears throat> the drunkard dreams of being a wealthy, young, and brave gentleman of great renown who is valiant in battle. Therefore, those wise men from the sacred land of the Vedas were not mistaken when they asseverated that this world is Maya, illusion. Ah, if only those wretched people would stop dreaming, then how different life would be. Ineffable remembrances reach my memory in these moments. On a given autumn night, I was amiably conversing with an adept within the superior worlds. The venerable one wanted to set a meeting with me here, down in this physical world, in this three-dimensional region. To, to define factors of time and place was necessary. Rudolantes complained, at 12 midnight, and so far from our home, right there in the center of the city of Mexico. Useless were her complaints. He and I set that meeting and uttered our pledge word. A taxi drove me along the road of Tlapan towards the Zocalo. I had to get off on the Bente de Noviembre Street, exactly in one of the corners of the Plaza de la Constitución. I had to pay for the ride. How much do I owe you? Two pesos, sir. Here it is. Take it. The driver received the money without even remotely suspecting anything about the motive of my trip. What can a dreaming one know? Could the poor, could the poor driver know about my studies? What could I expect from him? He was just another dreaming one driving a taxi. That is all. Thus I walked to the center of El Zocalo. I stopped in front of a great post of steel. This was the mast of our national flag. This was the exact place for our meeting. I had to first recognize the place, which I did. However, it was not even 10 o'clock yet on that night. I walked along the Cinco de Mayo Street, very slowly, very slowly. Hence, I arrived at El Parque de la Alamada. The ice from winter that breathes on the hills, where neither hues or aromas are swaying, was descending in refreshing silverly currents covering the withered prairies. I sat down on a bench in the park. The cold of that winter night was certainly tremendous. Here, there, and everywhere were children very well covered with winter clothing, happily playing. Austerely, the elders were conversing about things, maybe very serious and grave, or perhaps not so important. The people in love, with Luciferian looks of fire, were smiling. Lights of diverse colors were shining, and among those very graded and painteresque human ensembles in the new year, costumes were not missing. There were jubilant people enjoying themselves and taking a photograph beside the three wise men. 
smoke bursting forth out of the mountain, obscure nostalgia, strange passions, insatiable thirst, immortal tedium, tender and subconscious longing, undefined and infinite yearnings for the impossible is what humanity experiences in these moments. Many times walking close to the crystalline fountains next to the pines, I contemplated beautiful things, globes of various colors, symbolic representations of the old and new year, chariots pulled by the goats of Capricorn, etc., etc., etc. Only half of an hour was lacking to reach the time for the mysterious meeting in question. Many times I silently walked over there between the Zocalo and the Alameda. Suddenly, looking at the clock, I profoundly sighed while saying with a voice that overwhelmed my own self, finally, the hour is near. It was necessary to speed my footsteps a little in order to return once again to the place of the longed-for meeting. The bells of the old Metropolitan Cathedral resounded at 15 minutes to 12 midnight when I anxiously stopped in front of the national flag's mast. Then I looked around me, inquiring, searching for any sign that could show me the presence of the master. Finally, O oh God of mine, twelve strokes of the bell announced the new year and resounded on the towers of temple. Then I started to feel disappointed. When something unusual happened, I saw three people in front of me. They were a foreign family, maybe North American or British, I did not know. The gentleman advanced alone towards me. I attentively observed him. Yes, I know those features, that majestic countenance. He is the master. He congratulated me, hugged me, and wished for me a complete success for the year 1968. Suddenly, he withdrew. Nevertheless, I noticed in him something strange. He came to me as a somnambulist, unconscious, as if he was impelled by a force superior to him. This overwhelmed me and made me a little sad. Could it be that the consciousness of that master is awakened within the superior worlds, yet asleep in the physical world? Indeed, this is something strange, enigmatic, and profound. After the encounter with the master, I did not feel disappointed anymore. I felt joy in my heart. And so some Alan Vior, in this chapter called The Consciousness, is describing in a very beautiful way what it means to be awake. Pay attention as you are listening to this to the exquisite detail with, he de with which he describes even the most mundane aspects of his experience and how with the awakened consciousness, even those ordinary sensations from the physical world seem to take on a new life. And as he's going through this chapter, he's describing different states of consciousness. He starts in the very beginning talking about the higher states of consciousness and the higher realms, where everything is symbolic and archetypical. And if you meditate on those symbols, you'll, you'll, you'll perceive some of the depths of what he's describing there in the, in the, in the imagery that he talks about at the beginning. He talks about the sleep that we experience in our daily life. And he goes on to describe with such beauty the experience of being awake in the physical world. But he doesn't describe it with 
with words. He describes it in a way that touches the heart. He describes the experience of being awake without ever telling you that that's what he's describing. And then finally he concludes with a description of the master who he met with a different type of consciousness. He was asleep in the physical and awake in the astral. This chapter, and actually this, this whole book, is written in a poetic manner that touches the heart and educates us about the heart. What we see here is what it means to have the mind of a child. And when we experience teachings like this, we're helping to educate our heart, to educate our consciousness, Now, with regards to the heart, I want to say a little more about one section of this chapter, going back a bit. The emotions that people experience when they are asleep, that he draws attention to in the the middle of the chapter. And I want to to talk about these for a few minutes because many of these emotions that he's describing here, the romantic partners, the sage with his beautiful theories, the bard with his music, are things that we typically think of as being positive emotions. And yet the people who are experiencing these emotions are asleep. And so these emotions, in that sense, are not positive emotions. They're emotions that are manifesting through the ego. And these are ways that we can lose energy through the emotional center, even through emotions that seem to be good by our ordinary conceptualization of of, of good and evil. We can lose energy through the emotional center from, from... being overly romantic just as much as we can from being, being angry or, or hateful. We need to acquire balance and equilibrium in this center and be cognizant of how our energy is, is, is flowing out and being utilized within our body. Now, there's one more story related to a last aspect of the heart that I want to mention, which is intuition. I'm going to read here from the, the Mystery of the Golden Blossom. A very interesting story in a chapter called Awakened Men, where some young of you recounts an awakened monk called Tian Zhan went to visit the venerable master Hui Chang. Upon arrival, he very solemnly asked a certain ascetic, as, ascetic assistant if the true master was in the house. The mystic replied, Yes, but he is not receiving visitors. Tian Zhan said, Oh, what you are saying is extremely profound and strange. The anchor eyed assistant answered, not even the eyes of the Buddha can see him. And then Tian Zhan argued, the female dragon bears a baby dragon and the female phoenix bears the little phoenix. And then he left. 
Later, when Hui Chang emerged from his meditation and discovered what had occurred in the house, he hit the religious assistant. When Chen Zhan found out what had happened, he made the following comment, this old man deserves to be called the true master. The next day, Chen Zhan, the man of awakened consciousness, returned to visit the guru Hui Chang. And in accordance with exotic oriental custom, as soon as he saw the guru, he spread his shawl on the ground, preparing to sit down and receive his teachings. And Hui Chang said, it is not necessary, not necessary. Tian Zhan drew back a little, and the true master said emphatically, it's all right, it is all right. But suddenly, Tian Zhan took some steps forward again. Then the master said, no, no. Yet, Tian Zhan comprehended everything. He walked around the hierophant in a symbolic gesture and left. And later, the venerable master commented, much time has passed since the days of the blessed ones. People are very lazy now. Within 30 years, it will be very difficult to find a man like him. Strange attitudes, instant telepathic talk, flashes of intuition. To explain all this would be to mutilate the teaching our much beloved readers must grasp its deep significance. Hui Chang possessed the golden embryo. It is evident that he had realized the illuminating void within himself. Qian Zhan was also a man with awakened consciousness, someone who, although he had not yet realized the void himself, possessed the aureus flower. So this is what we call a, a Zen koan. It's a story that seems to rebel against our ordinary intellectual way of thinking and forces us to, to think and understand in a new way, to understand with intuition, with the heart. Now, there's something I want to emphasize about, uh, about koans, is that... Um, I've noticed uh, uh, Gnostics sometimes, um, they seem to think that the only purpose of the koan is to get the mind to be silent. And that is one of the purposes, that when we see the koan, we're, we're, we're faced with a, a, an intellectual contradiction that, um, that, that seems to stupefy us, and then our mind says, I can't do anything with this, and it shuts up. Now, that's one purpose of the koan, but that's not the only purpose. Because I've, 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 I've gone and I've asked Gnostics koans before, and they're like, oh, my mind is silent now. Yeah, it works. And I'm like, well, no, you're supposed to answer the koan. You're supposed to understand something about the koan. <laughs> you're supposed to have an intuitive grasp of, 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 what, this, of what this is. It's not just for your mind to be silent. It's meant to, to help bring you to a new type of understanding that's beyond the intellect. So there's a dual purpose there. The blank mind and the comprehension in the heart have to be together. But to try to explain these things, to intellectualize them, ruins it. There is an explanation for this koan. I could give it to you, but I won't. <laughs> because, as some of you says, to explain it would be to mutilate the teaching. Such as we so typically mutilate all great pieces of art. And um, an artist, in the art of the word, said a long time ago in his, his book, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, at the very beginning of the book, he put this warning. Persons attempting to find a motive in this narrative will be prosecuted. Persons attempting to find a moral in it will be banished. Persons attempting to find a plot in it will be shot. By order of the author per G.G., Chief of Ordnance. 
This was obviously a man who was frustrated with people getting into too much intellectual analysis of great works of literature. When we try to analyze art with the mind, we destroy it. We deprive it of its emotional character. That's like it would ruin the koan if I explained it to you. But you can understand it if you look into it and you try to perceive it with your heart. So do you have any questions? Yes. Yes. You mentioned something called personal loss and uh, showing up the scars. Uh, throughout Master Samayana Diora's books, he gives many different exercises that are uh, what I guess most people not within the Gnostic tradition would, would consider esoteric practices, mm -hmm. such as uh, the Nordic runes, uh, various mantras, um, invocations, Things designed to spin our chakras, etc. Yes. Um, how do how do those fit in with some of the more um, you know less esoteric exercises that you uh, that you outline for opening up the heart? I mean the the the, the exercises that you've mentioned are 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 absolutely useful too. This is um, uh, this is an introductory lecture, so I didn't go into the, the more esoteric things, but. There are many, many ways to cultivate the heart. With regards to the, the, the runes and the mantras that you talked about, the vowel O has a, has a special relationship with the heart and is, um, and is utilized for cultivating, uh, for, for cultivating intuition um, and, and positive emotion um, in, in developing that, that chakra. Um, the, mant the, the mantras and exercises that we do also have the... Um, the, the the purpose of, of sedating the mind and sedating the body, which also leads to uh, equilibrium in the emotions as well. So all of those exercises that you mentioned, um, the, the, the runes, uh, like the, particularly the, ru the rune os and the rune fa and the, um, the, the, the other runes that, 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 that we do, um, for which you can read about in the, the book Gnostic Magic of the Runes, uh, they're also very useful for, for, um, for that sort of balancing and development, particularly ones that involve the use of the vowel O. Yes? Oh, you mentioned um, that sometimes the, we'll have anger when we think somebody is doing something to us, and that person is probably not even doing anything to us. Yeah. Um, but it's, is it true that anger in itself is really never justified, even if that person is intentionally trying to hurt us. I agree with that assessment. That the um, I had a, I had a quote here. I'm not sure if I not sure if I um, if I kept it with me. Oh yes, some of the says, anger annihilates the capacity to think and to resolve the problems it originates. Obviously, anger is a negative emotion. And that's what happens when we get when we get into the, when we get involved in anger. It annihilates our capacity to think, and we never respond to the situation in the in the proper way because we're perceiving it through this lens of anger. And anger always feels like it's justified, and always feels like like we 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 need to cast judgment and 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 uh, have holy justice to send upon that person who 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 did the wrong thing. But 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 really, we're just delusional. It's yeah. It's 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 anger is is profoundly rooted in the ego, and so it's um, I am I emphasize the, the the anger that we that we get into in completely delusional situations, but we also get into anger in in situations that actually come to us in the physical world, and that's negative as well. So it's not true that Jesus was ever angry, because some people say, oh, Jesus was angry in the the temple. Well, Jesus, Jesus was uh, Jesus was a, a, a fallen bodhisattva, so maybe he did get angry personally. But that particular story about Jesus being angry in the temple, I think, is more closely real, closely related to the, the the anger of God, like they talk about in the, in the in the Old Testament, where when Jesus was going into the temple and and casting out 
the, the thieves and, and, and the money lenders. He was purifying the temple of, of the, the inhuman elements that buy and sell the doves of the Holy Spirit, that, that corrupt the temple. And so that's not an anger, per se, in the sense, uh, in the sense of the delusion that, that, that we experience. That is Jesus enacting the, 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 the passion of God and love for God in order to, to cast the inhuman elements out of himself. So it's kind of like, you know, oh, sort of, yeah, like this picture that we have, uh, that we have on the wall, the, the, the ferocity of the Divine Mother when she kills the ego. Yes? is really a gateway to be aware and transform an impression. Mm -hmm. So is it truly negative, or is it more neutral, but we're the ones who transform it into that state? I mean, with regards to whether it's negative or not, we, we want to remember that we don't want to create good and evil. We don't want to say, this is, this is evil, this is good, do this, don't do that. Remember, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And so there's, there's good in everything that's evil, and there's evil in everything that's good. We don't want to, to, to cast judgment on things, but we want to understand that certain actions have consequences. And we want to be cognizant of what those consequences are and um, be aware that we will reap what we sow. And, and so just that, 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 that little thing there. With regards to the emotions, the negative emotions are going to are going to come up as long as as long as we 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 have the ego. Um, they are negative in the sense that they emerge from the ego, but how much energy we lose to them um, is uh, is based on how much we get identified with them. Sort of like uh, our thoughts. Um, thoughts can pop up in the in the brain every so often, but um, is it depends on how much, uh, how much we get identified with those thoughts and how much will be how much energy we, we lose to them. Now, with related to um, the how, how you spoke of how the, the negative emotions can lead to a, a situation of overcoming temptation, that's sort of like what I was saying where there's good in everything that's evil, that the negative emotions, even though they are harmful, ev uh, even without being identified with them, even though the emotions are harmful, they do have the positive aspect that, that, that they, they're able to teach us something about ourselves and give us an opportunity to learn how to transform impressions better. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah.